Hello, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, first, I just wanna thank all of you all for joining today's webinar about LGBTQ advocacy in New York State. My name is Trevon Mears and I'm the Director of Policy and Community Outreach at the LGBT Center here in New York City. My preferred pronouns are he and him. And I'm joined by Shijuade Kadri, the Center's Chief Advocacy Officer. Um, before we start uh, today's webinar, I just want to mention a few things. Um, to keep in mind, um, everyone has been muted upon entry so as not to distract presenters and other participants while the webinar is taking place. We're also recording the webinar, so to make sure that we're moving forward, there will be a few pauses during the presentation where we will take written questions. So if you think of a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to type it and share it with us. Um, we hope to take a few questions from the chat during the presentation, and there will be an, another opportunity to ask questions again at the end. I know that this conversation is timely given the recent elections on Tuesday. Um, we saw landmark victories on ballot initiatives around the country, which helped to expand the right to vote uh, in places like Florida and Michigan and Nevada, uh, protect the rights of transgender and gender nonconforming people in Massachusetts and immigrants in Oregon. All of these were important and hard fought steps forward, but I think it's equally as important to recognize um, that we, and when I say we, I'm speaking on behalf of the center, but also acknowledging all of you who are joining this fight with us, um, what we're fighting for is bigger than a single election. Um, so the fight to protect uh, LGBTQ people is at a critical point, and it didn't end after election day. We know that there is a lot of progress to be made on LGBTQ rights across the country, and we think that it should start right here in New York. Um, so the composition of the Senate has now changed and what happens beyond election day will really set the groundwork for how we can work together to push New York State to move LGBTQ rights forward and to lead the way for the rest of the country. Um, today's webinar is meant to be a thoughtful and comprehensive discussion about how we can make that happen by working and mobilizing together. Um, so just a little bit of background for those of you who may not be as familiar with the center. Um, activism and advocacy have been cornerstones of the center's work since we were founded in 1983. Our mission is to recognize, respond to, and celebrate the many intersections and identities that make up our community. And in our 35 year history, many people have come to know the center as not only a hub of LGBTQ organizing and, and innovation, but also as a provider of programs and services to the community that includes um, everything from health and wellness to parent, parent and family support services to youth programs, art, arts, entertainment, and cultural events. Um, here at the center, we see more than 6,000 visitors per week, and our building serves as a meeting space for more than 300 community groups. So the center launched our Rides Out Advocacy Initiative, understanding that the LGBTQ community really needed a, a unified voice and vision to help usher in the next phase of LGBT uh, civil rights here in New York. Um, advocacy, just as a term, can sometimes feel intimidating, but the concept is really simple. Advocacy is everything from organizing, educating, voting, research, storytelling, and lobbying. Um, to me, advocacy is really every little thing that we do with all of these concepts that help to change the world. So whether it's talking to friends and reminding them to get the, to the polls on election day, which we did here at the center, um, or going down to a town hall to speak up on issues that you care about or telling your story, all of these activities work together. Um, and really our goal in sort of stepping into this space is to empower community with the tools and resources that they need to understand how to advocate on issues that are important to them, whether that's understanding the basics of civic engagement and how a bill becomes a law, or leading the charge in your respective communities by organizing to get as many people involved in LGBTQ advocacy as you can. All of this works in tandem to help bring about the change and the future that we want to see in New York. And while we're on the topic of New York, um, 
I just wanted to mention that LGBTQ rights in New York has been stagnant for quite a long time. Um, so there has been no major legislation passed to advance LGBTQ equality in New York since 2011. Um, as many of you might know, um, 2011 was the year that LGBTQ um, marriage equality was passed in New York State. Um, and that was a moment that New York really stood out as a progressive beacon to the rest of the country, because as you know, the rest of the country did not um, have marriage equality until um, four years later. And so that's why some people find it a little shocking to learn that since then, New York has not passed laws to protect or expand the rights of LGBTQ people. Um, and as a result, um, we continue to face uh, extreme disparities in basic services and the quality of life. So on the screen are just a couple of statistics um, that I wanted to go over. Um, New York State Senate has passed more than 1,500 pieces of legislation this year in 2018, and not one specifically addressed the needs of LGBTQ people. Um, and Trans and gender nonconforming New Yorkers are also 140% more likely to live in poverty than cisgender people. And many um, of those folks still face uh, significant barriers to things like employment, healthcare, and access to safe and inclusive settings. Um, and then lastly, New York State's laws protecting abortion are outdated and could put LGBTQ people in jeopardy. So today, abortion law um, in New York still resides in the criminal code, which subjects a pregnant person and health providers to criminal consequences for getting the access to the care that they need. Um, so really just to take a step back and address not only what's here, but um, from needs that we heard uh, within the community, we really tried to bring diverse sectors of the community together and understand the challenges that people were facing, not just in New York City, but in regions all across New York City, because we recognized that um, unmet needs in New York looks a lot different in other parts of the state. And so with all of this information is how we uh, created our agenda that we hope to move forward with. Um, so for this work, um, in creating our, our agenda for the future of LGBTQ rights in New York State, it was really important for us to gather information in a thoughtful and meaningful way. And so to do that, we started conducting a series of statewide conversations with LGBTQ serving organizations. Um, we collected feedback from community members. We convened LGBTQ leadership with the goal of really open, openly sharing ideas on how to best tackle the issues that we saw in communities and the issues that they were raising. Um, so we convened conversations statewide, um, which really was understanding uh, challenges and the vision for the future of the community. Um, we also convened LGBTQ leadership. So um, in April, we convened 30 LGBTQ leaders from regions across the state, and we also did the same in October. Um, during that meeting, um, LGBTQ leadership filled out regional scorecards to identify priority issues and understand diverse perspectives on how best to tackle those issues. Um, we also conducted a statewide youth survey really to engage younger folks in the conversation and to see what ideas they had around LGBTQ um, uh, issues in New York State as they currently exist and what changes they want to see. Um, we also met with stakeholders individually to ask what their needs were and what would make their work more effective in this space. Um, and then lastly, we had an internal working group here at the center to really guide and inform our activities um, in a thoughtful way to help provide feedback throughout the process. So from there, uh, we move forward with creating the People's Platform. Um, really, it is meant to be an inclusive and people-centered plan um, that uh, will guide our fight for LGBTQ affirming legislations and, and policy statewide. Um, so the platform reflects our 
uh, values and our needs as we work to empower and mobilize the more than 1 million people um, in New York who make up the LGBTQ community um, through our statewide advocacy initiative called Rise Out. So in short, we're working to advance equity and inclusion for transgender and gender non-conforming people. We're working to increase access to affirming mental health services. We're working to promote restorative justice justice principles, to ensure LGBTQ visibility and affirmation, and to demand e economic justice um, by prioritizing the needs of low-income LGBTQ people. So in our next couple of slides, we're going to go through um, exactly, unpack this a little bit more, and understand exactly what we mean by these big buckets of work. Hi, everyone. This is Shudu Kadri. Uh, from the Center Chief Advocacy Officer. And I wanted to just, um, before we go into a deeper dive around the actual platform issues, wanted to address a few questions that we anticipate might come up. One, which is how do we decide what should be included? Because when we really think about it, the LGBT community needs um, are diverse. And uh, how can we capture and essentialize what the community needs in just a few items? So first, we wanted to be sure not to duplicate efforts or resources already being driven towards uh, work. We know that there are lots of leaders in this space. There are folks who are more experienced and refined with certain aspects like, for example, youth homelessness. Um, and we wanted, one thing that we see and have experienced within the community is that there tends to be um, a diversification of financial and bandwidth and staff resources. And we didn't want to be picking up the mantle of work that other organizations are doing, but rather enhance and add those, our resources to that work. Two, we wanted to pick up places where we saw a lack of coordinated advocacy, where we heard communities saying, we need this thing to be done, but there was no one organization or coalition really taking that work on. We also know that it is extremely important to us as an organization and in leading this work to explicitly center issues impacting transgender and gender non-conforming and non-binary folks, as well as queer communities of color. Because we know that those communities are the most impacted within the larger LGBT um, uh, community and that in order for us to start addressing the larger community, if we work on on supporting the most vulnerable community members, we all benefit from that. And then of course, this is on balance of where we think we can win together, uh, especially given the time that we're in now nationally, the fact that uh, New York State has an opportunity to really be a paradigm of progressive leadership as we once were, uh, is something that we wanna be cognizant of. And not to mention that we know next year, for example, is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riot. Uh, we're hosting World Pride in New York State, and this is really, um, it's sort of an overdone time for us to be thinking about how we get our elected officials to really stand up visibly and unequivocally for a community. The other thing I wanted to address was, um, again, where you may not see certain bills or, or information on here, it's not because we may not be supporting it, it's that we're not leading on it because of the issues I just went, uh, explained around duplication of efforts and resources and lack of coordinated advocacy. We want to uh, use what uh, limited resources we have to be really incisive and where we think we can be effective in advocating on behalf of the larger community and we'll continue to uplift and support organizations uh, and other coalitions leading on other important community needs, not specifically addressed here. The other thing that's important to note is that platforms are organic as the sort of political landscape changes, as the will of, and power of the people changes, this platform will also be modified over time. It's not meant to be a fixed piece of information that is not responsive to community need and uh, the landscape that we're a part of. So before we dive in uh, to the actual items on the platform, does anyone have any questions about how we've gotten to this point? Okay. Just before you um, move on, a reminder, if you think of a question um, during the presentation, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to type it and share it with us. Um, just 
for those who missed that introduction. Thanks, Siobhan. So now our first uh, item is around equity and inclusion for TGNT people. And what you'll see as we go through each of these item, uh, platform items is that we have a vision statement and then we have some more specific legislation or policies that we'll be working on um, for next year. But also uh, the vision is meant to be as broad and as inclusive of the community priorities that we heard so that even if you don't see your specific item on here, hopefully the vision aligns with other interest that you might have as a community member. So for TGNC equity and inclusion, we envision safe, inclusive, and affirming settings for TGNC people that are free from discrimination and violence. What that translates to on the ground um, are three bills that are currently before the New York State Legislature. The legislature consists of two houses, the Assembly and the Senate. Um, the first bill we have is Genda which is uh, the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act. And this bill um, essentially would add gender identity and expression as a protected class under the human rights law. Right now, we only have an executive action that allows uh, TGNC and non-binary folks uh, to be protected under the human rights law. And what we would love is for that to be codified so that no matter who is in office, uh, these protections remain on the books. The next two bills around gender neutral single occupancy bathrooms and three options for sex designation on New York State identification are just around acknowledging that just because we have a piece of civil rights legislation passed, it doesn't mean that that community automatically feels included and affirmed and celebrated. And these are just two examples of bills that are currently before the legislature that if passed, would start to chip away at some of the barriers to everyday humanity and dignity that TGNC individuals face around the state. Um, moving forward with um, the second item on the platform is around increased access to affirming mental health services. So we envision reduced barriers to culturally competent and affirming services for LGBTQ people living with mental health challenges. Um, and what that translates to is um, legislation um, around banning conversion therapy in New York State. Um, so New York has yet to um, institute a ban on conversion therapy, which is a medically discredited practice used to forcibly change a queer person's identity with techniques like shaming, electric shocks, and induced vomiting. Um, conversion therapy is based on pretty disturbing ideas about how queer identities um, are fundamental disorders um, and is primarily aimed at LGBTQ youth. So this is another area that we want to address um, with, the, with the platform. Next up, we have restorative justice principles. We envision holding criminal offenders accountable while advocating for balanced restorative justice practices. For us, this is a larger conversation around making sure that our platform brings forth an intersectional lens to this work. And when we say intersectional, we mean recognizing, of course, we all have multiple identities, but that for some individuals in this society, those identities end up linking into multiple forms of oppression. So we have, for example, queer people of color, queer people of trans experience, queer youth, uh, and then all the intersections within those identities who often face over-criminalization in our society. And we wanted to make sure that we created a space on our platform to recognize those disparities, but then more importantly, to try and to be proactive around how to address those concerns. So here, we heard consistently from community members around the state that uh, we needed to create if we were going to sort of bring these resources together and raise awareness around this, that we needed to uh, raise awareness around the criminal justice system and how that impacts entire livelihoods, such as where you get to live, where you're able to work, how you're able to access your family, and how identity uh, within the community around sexual orientation and gender identity and expression compounds the negative impact of the criminal justice system. 
So to make sure we're all operating on a, the same definition, restorative justice is an evidence-based alternative approach to reducing violence and protecting public safety. It views crime beyond the act of breaking the law and recognizes that certain crimes require thoughtfully addressing the harm caused to people, relationships, and the broader community. So when it comes to items on our, our sort of legislative and policy platform here, one of the items we have is around limiting the use of the gay slash trans panic defense. Right now, uh, almost without merit, someone can say, I physically attacked or harmed this person because I thought that they were approaching me based on their, uh, my perception of their sexual orientation or gender identity. We don't want to have folks um, using such bigoted defenses in court. And so one bill that's currently pending that has not moved yet that we support is limiting the use of that uh, gay or trans panic defense. The second is around removing abortion from the criminal code and ensuring constitutional protections are reflected in New York law. New York actually has uh, the sort of the, the right to access a safe abortion has, was on the books before Roe v. Wade. The challenge has been is that it's currently in the criminal code. So if you are in central or upstate New York where you might not have access to as many providers as you do in some of the larger um, cities around the state, you technically can still be arrested and subject to criminal penalties if you are seeking what otherwise should be a safe uh, uh, health procedure. And so removing abortion from the criminal code minimizes that risk for the patient and for the doctor and actually moves it to the public health code, which is where it should be given that we're talking about a medical procedure. The last uh, item we have on this list is a reporting bill on the Hate Crimes Act that collects and reports on sexual orientation and gender identity, that's SOGI, data, and racial and ethnic identity of victims and the alleged perpetrators. I wanna add some context to what that means uh, for folks on the call. As we were doing uh, sort of research and conversations over the last year, but really as a community center hearing from community over our, our 35 year existence, when gender was introduced, we immediately um, heard concerns from uh, members in the community who were concerned that if we have a hate crimes bill, if we are protecting TGNC identified community members and saying that anyone who attacks them can be convicted of a hate crime, we then come back to this circular argument that uh, if you're convicted of a hate crime, then you're going to be facing criminal penalties. There's an enhanced criminal sentence Hello. that comes with a hate crime conviction. A hate crime conviction. Hello. Hi. Hi, who's there? Is it an Adele song maybe starting? Hello? <laughs> um, what we have, um, I think Stephen, you're raising your hand. We'll take one break in a moment for questions and I um, will be sure to call on you. Uh, to go back to this idea around hate crimes, apologies uh, for the break for a moment. Hate crimes convictions allow for enhanced criminal penalties. And what we know anecdotally is that the individuals most likely to be subject to negative police interactions and potentially negative interactions with the criminal justice system are queer folks, youth, and people of color. And so what we um, believe is likely the case is that if we have hate crimes protections codified in law around sexual orientation and gender identity, the individuals most likely to be arrested are members of our own community and the most vulnerable within our own community. So what we uh, have tried to do here is balance what we heard from community as wanting support for agenda, wanting this protection codified in law with other community members who are concerned about the over-criminalization of queer people of color and of queer youth. So this reporting bill on the Hate Crimes Act is pending introduction. We're currently looking for a sponsor in the Senate or the Assembly and would allow us to start collecting data around the uh, identity of victims and alleged perpetrators. And we have reason to believe that it is likely the folks who this law is designed to protect that are most likely to be arrested and sentenced to jail. And in order to inform what a fix to this looks like, 
we need data to back that up. And we want the state to provide that data so that it's unequivocal in terms of the veracity of it, but also in hopes that when the state sees this, they too will get on board with working with community to figure out how we best address the disparities that we see in a criminal justice system uh, for the community. That's a great segue um, into our next item, which is around LGBTQ visibility and affirmation. So we envision fair and accurate representation of LGBTQ people across their lifespan through consistent data collection and analysis. Um, what this translates to is legislation that would revive um, Governor Cuomo's 2014 LGBT, LGBT data collection initiative um, that would reinstate a requirement that eight New York State agencies collect SOGI data. SOGI is sexual orientation and gender identity data. Um, and we will also seek to expand it to all direct service New York State agencies. Um, so we know that New York does not consistently collect or analyze full demographic, um, social and economic data that we need to support community needs. Um, and so we know that there's also power in being counted, especially if legislation requires the state to do so. Um, so fair and accurate data really ensures political and economic representation, and it helps us hold elected, account uh, elected officials accountable by making sure that they can't ignoring us by claiming that they don't know that we exist. And the final item on our platform is around economic justice, where we envision prioritizing the needs of low-income LGBTQ people by supporting opportunities that end cycles of poverty, homelessness, and other forms of social and economic marginalization. What that translates to for us is the creation, funding, and promotion of economic justice opportunities that are specifically tailored to the LGBTQ community with a particular focus on LGBTQ youth, people, color, and tg and individuals. We know that our community faces higher rates of joblessness, poverty, and overall economic loss. And we also know that we are, we've just elected two houses of the state and a governor who say that they center and support the community and want to be able to provide more uh, tactical support. And we see economic justice as a, a necessary support in order to continue to meet the needs of community around the state. Because of the increased rates of poverty within the community, having uh, opportunities that are tailored to the community not only centers and uplifts them, but allows for some of the disparities to be addressed. For example, we know that approximately 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. When you are kicked out of your home at 16, your housing is at risk, your food security is at risk, your educational attainment might be impacted, your ability to maintain stable uh, a stable job or otherwise or other career development is also at risk and so then when you're 25 and trying to be able to show job history stable housing uh, or getting references from prior jobs it can be extremely difficult and so we want the state not only to recognize this but to help us work with state agencies job uh, and career opportunities employers to be able to say like hey this is a way to specifically tailor your workforce development in a way that recognizes the disparities that this community faces that do not speak to communities employability or opportunities to be successful in any given role. And by drawing attention to this, we know that the governor has prioritized workforce development in several of his funding initiatives. And what we're asking for is really to recognize that the LGBTQ community needs an additional level of support to be equitable in competing for jobs in today's workforce. So um, before we open it back up for questions, I, I assume that a question, and I hope that a question that a lot of you will be asking is, what's next and what can I do and how can I get involved? Um, the first thing is that as the, as the center's advocacy work continues to grow, it's important for us to make sure that the more than one million LGBTQ people um, in New York are connected, informed, and engaged in the fight. So I would be 
forever grateful if all of you listening could take two seconds to grab your cell phone and text the word rise out r-i-s-e-o-u-t to the number 69866 Um, by doing so you will join our rise out mobile network and automatically start receiving alerts on ways to take action um, in new york whenever there's an opportunity to be heard and really make a difference so that includes um, updates on voter registration deadlines election dates and other form of civic forms of civic engagement. Um, Some of you might already be signed up, and if you already are, I encourage you to share um, this information with friends and make sure that they're a part of the fight too. Um, So really it's just joining and then spreading the word to make sure that it's out there. Um, The second way to get involved is to read our Rise Out Bootcamp. Um, So if you go to gaycenter.org forward slash advocacy, um, Rise Out Bootcamp is a curriculum that we created really for folks to refine their skills as an activist. Um, So it has information on how any level of participation advocacy can be influential from folks who just want to know how to fill out a a voter registration form to folks that want to be able to host a town hall meeting or a other um, public education forms in their community to get people involved. Um, Third is really just contacting your representatives. So uh, ask your senator and assembly member how they um, will support the policies outlined in the People's Platform, which again was mentioned here, but you can also find it on our website. Um, And then lastly, just following the center on social, um, making sure that you're up to date uh, with any news and other updates that we might offer throughout the course of the year while we're pushing um, these items forward. So with that said, I'm going to open it back up for questions. Thanks, Siobhan. I see one question here from Sammy that is, how do you envision other LGBT organizations supporting, signing up, and sharing the platform? I think for all the ways that I just mentioned, um, I think getting out the word would be super important and a sort of like a first step of how um, to get folks mobilized and engaged. Um, so to the extent that you can share the text code and make sure that people are signed up. Um, it's also just letting the center know about any activities that you might have um, where you are and how we might be able to support that as well. So if you are doing an event that's advocacy focused or if you think that your members might be um, interested in learning about some of the um, information that's in our Rise Out Bootcamp curriculum, it's really just bridging that conversation, connecting us um, to make sure that we can relay that information as best as we can. I'll also add that for individuals who want to support, I'll paste this in the group chat link. You can actually go to our website and submit your support um, on the People's Platform. We're trying to build power in the same way that you do with petitions by showing that there are thousands of New Yorkers, members of the community and allies as well who want to see this work move forward. Uh, For organizations that are interested, um, please feel free to reach out to me or Trevon directly. We do have um, different partnership levels that people can engage in. Um, I should say it's not about money at all. Actually, it's just about helping to spread the word because we really have to be working together kind of uh, in the river to justice, rowing in the same direction for this to work. And we want to have as many partners and be supportive of of as many other partners as possible so that we all get to reap the benefits of civil rights progression. Are there Um, any other questions? Sorry. I will also just add that if you think of a question or um, while you're still digesting a lot of the items that um, we went over on the platform, um, it's never too late. You can always reach out to us um, at advocacy at gaycenter.org and submit any questions that you might have and sort of like start the conversation or continue the conversation if you didn't get a chance to ask something here. Um, with that said, I just wanted to thank you all for joining today's webinar. I hope that it was informative and comprehensive. Oh, 
I think we have one more question. Um, I think we have another question around volunteer opportunities. Um, if you email advocacy at jcenter.org, we will connect you with opportunities as they come up. So that's also another way to stay plugged in. All right. Um, that said, thank you all for joining today's webinar. I hope that it was informative and comprehensive. And stay in touch if you have any uh, other questions. Make sure that you read up on our platform, as Juju uh, talked about, gaycenter.org forward slash advocacy, um, and sign up. I also want to echo that. Thank you all. And just remember that the elections are over, and now the real work begins. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.